Hey, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward here with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Live video Q&A for Friday, January the 3rd. And today, as always, I'm going to be hanging out here for the next hour and discussing strategies and mindsets and tactics to help you build muscle, burn fat, lose the gut, and get in your best shape this year, right? This is a brand new year. I mean, welcome to 2020. And I want to do what I can to help you get 2020 started on the right track. So if you're tuning in live right now, let me know if you can hear me, you can see me. This is coming through loud and clear. I always want to do a quick little audio video check, make sure it's all coming through good. So if you could do that for me, I would appreciate it. And I've got some uh, some good uh, good news to share today, like some 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 things that are going to help you when it comes to reaching your fitness and fat loss goals in 2020. I've got a, a special challenge coming up. And if you are up for the challenge, I'm going to tell you all about it very shortly. All right. So just make sure we who we got joining us. We've got jerseys. We've got Rick. We've got Nicholas. Is it coming through loud and clear? Okay, it is. Say it's coming through loud and clear. All right. Let's just see here. Okay, just give me a second, guys. All right. Boom. Done. All right. Good stuff. So I was a few minutes late getting started with the video chat today. Uh, <laughs> and the, the reason for that is because just literally like five minutes before I was scheduled to go live, like I was in here in my office, all set up, ready to go. And my young fellow was outside. He's my three-year-old son, Harvey. He was running back and forth the hall, and he was working himself up, getting so excited that he ended up making himself sick, and he ended up throwing up, like, literally right outside my office door. So my wife's got dinner on the stove. The son just threw up, and, like, man, <laughs> I got to help her. So that's why I'm, like, 15 minutes late starting this video chat today is because literally just before we got going, I had to uh, give her give her a hand to clean up the, the mess. Thankfully, I mean, he wasn't sick or anything. He was just running around like a, like you know, like a three-year-old, right, going crazy and, and all excited and stuff. And he ended up working himself up so much that he ended up, uh, he lost his lunch because he got so worked up. So anyway, that happens, right? So that's why I was a few minutes late. Anyway, got that cleared up. We're good to go. Hopefully nobody throws up during this video chat. <laughs> Let's keep it going. All right. So who we got joining? Again, several people tuning in. Uh, if you are new to these video chats and you've never tuned into one of these before, let me know in the uh, in the comment section there in the in the video chat. Type in the letter N if you are new to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat, and if you are a regular, you tuned into these before, and you know you're you're a, you're a regular to the crew, then type in the letter R. I'd like to know. Just see who we got new and and returning. Just let me know there. And uh, during today's video chat. One of the things that I want to emphasize is we've got uh, something really special coming up, and it's on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page is where you can get more information about it. It's a brand new Lose Your Gut Challenge. Now, some of you have been through the Lose Your Gut Challenge in the past. I've ran two of these challenges already, and they're very powerful challenges. It's a five-day intensive Lose Your Gut Challenge where we're really going to dive in deep with the aspects of nutrition and mindset and strategies of how to apply yourself when it comes to reaching your fitness and fat loss goals. And uh, I'm just looking through the chat there, I see some people who've already been through some previous challenges there, which is cool to see. And what I'm doing now is this is per going to take place next week on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page. In fact, we're creating a private Facebook group just for people who are going to participate in our Lose Your Gut in 2020 challenge. So it's a five-day intensive challenge. Now, the way these challenges work, I mean, I'm not expecting you to physically lose all your gut and go from fat to ripped in five days. No, I'm, I'm not making a claim. I mean, that's ridiculous. Nobody can go from you know fat to shredded in five days. But you can make some habit and lifestyle changes in five days. You can change up here in five days, and then that indirectly can, can transform you for weeks, months, years onwards, right? So we're going to make some some mental changes, habit changes, the, the changes that need to happen first before the physical changes. 
So that's going to be happening now uh, next week on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page. So if you're already following me on Facebook, you're already, you know, you've liked the, the Total Fitness Bodybuilding page, you're part of our private uh, Total Fitness Bodybuilding group, you, you've you already seen this. I've made a couple posts about it already. Uh, I'm going to be making some more posts. And this is something that if you are serious about losing fat, building muscle, and, and like losing that gut, getting yourself in shape in 2020, this is something you want to do. It's going to kickstart the new year off on the right track. So head on over there, like the Facebook page, join the group, and you'll be getting more information about what's involved with the Lose Your Gut Challenge. Now, I want to address a common thing that I often hear because I, I've shared this before. Like I said, I've ran two of these Lose Your Gut Challenges, and the feedback that I've received has been phenomenal. Like you, you can even check out the feedback that's posted on the Facebook page just to see some of the results that people have gotten after going through the five-day challenge. But one of the things I keep hearing over and over again is some people will say, well, I don't like Facebook. I don't use Facebook. Can you take me through the challenge without Facebook? And the simple answer is no. The reason why is because Facebook has such an amazing platform already there for free that we can take advantage of. It's, it's an amazing community setup. So th this cannot happen without Facebook. All right, like it would it would cost me thousands of dollars in website developers and programmers to create something that wouldn't even be nearly as good as what we have access to on Facebook for free. So it's just not feasible or practical to try and duplicate a, a Facebook or that kind of community membership aspect uh, off, off Facebook. So for those of you, like some people say, well, I don't like Facebook, I don't use it and whatever. Like you can sign up for a free account. It takes like five minutes. Probably not even that. Like sign up for a free account. You don't need to go adding everybody that you know as friends. Even if you have zero friends, it doesn't matter. Like sign up for a free account, like the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page, request to join the group, and you can participate in the challenge. It's totally free and it'll take you like five minutes. And if, if you're not willing to take five minutes and free <laughs> to reach your fitness and fat loss goals, then obviously you're not that serious about achieving them. So stop deceiving yourself and just be happy being fat and overweight and out of shape. Like that's the reality. Like this is a free coaching program for five days where we're going to help to transform the way that you look at food, fitness, nutrition, and, and the whole aspect of getting in shape. It is a transformational five days. I guarantee you that. And it's it's totally free on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page. So if you want to join in, hey, take advantage of it, right? I'm offering to help you. <laughs> if you want to come on board, then take advantage of it. If you don't, that's cool as well, right? I know some people just like to sit around and watch on the sidelines and not really active or interested in taking action. Hey, if, if that's, that, there's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, if that's you, then then so be it. I mean, you could have worse hobbies and habits that you're, you do rather than watching fitness videos on YouTube. But if you want to actually make some serious progress, some change, go ahead, check that out. If you have any questions about it, feel free to email me. My personal email address is leeh at leehayward.com. You can email, we you can chat about it, or you can message me through Facebook, right? That's what I like about it. I mean, Facebook is an amazing communication tool. That's why I like it. That's why I use it. I mean, I know it has some drawbacks and you get all caught up in the social media crap, but if you use it as a communication tool to talk to people, to help people and, you know, interact like, like I do with the lose your gut challenge and my uh, private coaching group that I have, it's an amazing tool, right? So you can, you can look at it from a positive or a negative aspect. So if, if you want to just kind of streamline it towards the positive, we can do that. And uh, yeah, check it out. I'll have in the replay of this video, I'll put links to all that stuff down in the description below, but obviously where this is a live video right now, it's the replays are not there for you. Those of you who are watching this live or sorry, the, the links are not there for those of you watching this live. All right, guys. So the way this works now, I'm going to be answering any questions that you may have when it comes to getting yourself back in shape. So if there's anything that you would like to discuss, right? Questions about fitness, nutrition, workouts, nutri uh, fat loss strategies, anything like that, feel free to post them in our chat window. I know the regulars, who we have a lot of regulars tuning in. We have a few new people here. So welcome if you're brand new. Uh, but the regulars know what to do. They have already started posting their questions. So I'm just going to start running through and uh, taking those questions one by one and see how many we can uh, we can bang out over the next hour. So, uh, again, we have Rick joining us. Jersey's joining us. Daniel is joining us. William is joining us. Dave is here. Uh, Robert's tuned in. Awesome, guys. Uh, we have 
MRK saying, I'm just curiously from your opinion why your channel died. I mean, you're barely getting a thousand views on your videos. I really have no idea why the YouTube algorithms have changed. I have no idea. So the bottom line, I mean, I, I know like you look at the greater scheme of YouTube and like some channels are, are blowing up. Some channels are not like I, I have an old channel. So I guess it's <laughs> out with the old and in with the new maybe from the YouTube algorithm. But honestly, it, it doesn't bother me. It really doesn't bother me that much because the people who do follow my videos tend to enjoy them. Like the, the ratio of likes to dislikes that I get is, is very positive. And then the, when I'm actually talking to people who follow my content, the, it's very positive. And I get a lot of people who I have personal connections with, you know, like actually coaching them, uh, phone conversations and build a, like a real connection, not just, you know, a, 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 how, how do I even say it? Like when you, ha when you have a big channel, and you millions of subscribers and, and, you know, hundreds and thousands of views and thousands of comments. Like, you can't have that intimate connection with people. Like, very few channels do what I'm doing right now to have this type of connection. So the fact that it's actually small is, is an advantage because even though I'm not reaching uh, millions of people, the few people that I am reaching are actually getting results and seeing a change. And I like that. I like having a, a small group of people who are actually seeing results. So I'm quite content with it. I mean, I know I'm not getting a shit ton of views and stuff, but uh, hey, I enjoy what I do. People who watch my content enjoy it, and it's all good, right? You, you know, you don't have to have the biggest channel on YouTube to to enjoy it and, and to keep doing it, right? I mean, I'm happy with the the small little community that I got going here. I, I actually really do enjoy it. Uh, David's tuned in, and he's saying, Happy New Year. Uh, like your whole body video series. And that's another thing I've got going on, a brand new training series. And I've got a new video in the works. It's in editing right now. So that should be posted up. Uh, I'll probably be posted up uh, on Monday or, or somewhere around there. So you can look forward to seeing that one coming soon. But that is the next series in the uh, New Year's Get Back in Shape workout series that I've been posting on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. Uh, who else we got? N O S M O no smo <laughs> is joining in. Uh, Nicholas is joining in, and he's asking: Do small amounts of alcohol inhibit muscle growth? Well, you got to look at the bigger picture. First off, is alcohol helping with your muscle? No, it is not. Right? When it comes to alcohol, that is definitely not helping. Now, is it hindering? It really depends. Like, how much are you drinking? How frequently are you drinking? The, 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 the the volume is what's going, the volume and the frequency is what's going to determine the, the impact. I mean, if you have a social drink on the weekends, like, I don't know, you go out and have a couple beers with your buddies on the weekend, or you, you like to have a glass of wine with dinner when you go to a restaurant on the weekend or, or something like that, you know, no, it's not helping, but it's such a small and infrequent thing that it's really, the negative implications are, are, are nil. Like it's, Okay, you you might have you you be, could be a hundred percent on track, or you could be ninety seven percent on track. Like in the greater scheme of things, it's it's such a small difference. Like it's it's still good enough. Like you can be good enough to, and make progress consuming small amounts of alcohol. Now, if you're drinking regularly uh, and frequently in high amounts, then that's going to have more of a negative impact. It's going to have a bigger impact not only on your muscle growth, but it's also going to impact fat loss. Fat loss is, is huge because when you have alcohol in your system, your body cannot burn body fat. When there's alcohol in your system, that alcohol has to get metabolized first before you're going to resume burning calories as normal. So when you combine alcohol plus the poor food choices that people make when they are drinking alcohol, that's where you get the, the negative effects. That's where the beer belly and, and all, you know, people getting fat from alcohol comes about. It's because, you know, you're, you're, you drink, your bodies can't burn body fat until that alcohol gets metabolized. When you're under the influence of alcohol, you're not making good food choices, right? Nobody says, Hey, let's go out for a chicken salad after they've been out drinking. No, they usually go out for pizza or burgers or fries or chicken wings or, or whatever. You're, you're, you're eating junk. You, so suppressed, Ability to burn body fat, com compound that with, with high calorie, high fat, junk food, you've got a deadly combination for getting fat. And that's why people very often get fat when they drink a lot of alcohol. 
as far as the muscle growth is concerned, I mean, it can have a negative impact on your hormones. Uh, it hinders your sleep and your recovery. I mean, obviously it, it's not helping. It's definitely not helping. But if you're doing it in small amounts in moderation, infrequently, like once a week or something like that, it's, it's not going to make a big difference. Like when I was younger, I used to go out and have a few social drinks, like literally a few social drinks on the weekend. And I still was, was able to make progress throughout my, my twenties and thirties, you know, uh, over the last, over the last eight years, I haven't drank alcohol in eight years. And the reason for that, actually, no, it's nine years going on nine years now. The reason for that is because I, I just don't really want to. I have no craving, no desire for it, so I just stopped drinking it. But I, the reason I actually remember the date and everything else is because the last time I competed in bodybuilding was in 2011. And in my contest prep, I stopped drinking alcohol as part of my contest prep. And after the show was over, I didn't want to resume it. Like I said, I just went six months without any alcohol. And I said, I feel great. I don't want to continue it. So, I mean, after the show was over... I, I didn't go back to drinking and I haven't drank since. So that was 2011 and I haven't drank since 2011 and I feel great. It's, it was one of those things. I didn't enjoy it. I only did it because it was socially acceptable and you know, you fit in, like you go somewhere and people say, Hey, have a drink or, you know, let's, let's go out for a drink. And so I did that. I went out and, but now I don't do that anymore. If I go out for a social get together with somebody, like I'll, I'll have a cup of tea. I'll have a cup of coffee or I'll just have a bottle of water. Like, I don't care anymore about drinking alcohol and, and I'm beyond the phase where anybody can peer pressure me into it. Right. When I was younger, I used to give in to peer pressure when people say, Oh, come on, have a drink, have a beer. Right. And I would, you know, young and dumb and naive and everything else. I'd okay. I'll, I'll give into it. Nowadays, like nobody could force me to drink. Like if, if somebody kept, you know, forcing me to drink, then I would just tell them to piss off and I wouldn't be friends with them anymore. Like that's where I'm at at this stage of the game. Right. But uh, anyway, move on. That was that answers your question, hopefully, about alcohol. What else we got? The experiment ASD saying hi, coach. Happy to catch your live video chat. I have a problem with two things. Should I drink my protein before or after workout alone or with carbs? I read that carbs after a workout affect growth hormone levels. This really depends on you, your goals, your situation, your diet, all this kind of stuff, right? There's no right or wrong answer, but I'm going to kind of give you some suggestions. First off, a post-workout shake uh, or, or pre-workout shake, there, there's nothing magical about pre or post-workout. For, for like 99% of you watching this, like you, you don't need pre or post-workout as long as your overall nutrition is on par. Like if you're getting a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, you're getting enough calories to recover and grow and meet your physical goals, whether that's gaining muscle, losing body fat, improving athletic performance, what, like whatever it is that you're actually training for, like your calorie intake has to match your goals. You know, if you want to lose body fat, obviously you need to be in a deficit. You want to gain muscle. You want to be in a very slight surplus. Uh, if your goal is athletic performance, you probably want to be around a maintenance Right. So, I mean, it really depends on, on you, your goals. But if your nutrition is in line with your goals, you're consistent with your nutrition, uh, pre and post workout nutrition or like pre and post workout protein shakes and all this has a very little impact because it, it, our, our body takes time to break down and digest food. Like if, if, if you consume something right after the workout, like it takes hours for that food to get broken down and digested. Even the protein shake, it still takes several hours for that protein shake to get broken down and digested. So what you're utilizing during the workout and after the workout for fuel is the food you've eaten hours before the workout, right? That's what your body is breaking down to. Like even, even in the day before the workout, like because food gets stored as glycogen in the muscle cells and stuff. So it's not as rapid as a lot of people think where they think, well, I'll have a protein shake before the workout and that will fuel my workout. It, 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 it's, it's a longer term thing going on. Like what you're burning during your workout is food that's been digested and in the system hours ago, not stuff that you have right before or after your training. So it doesn't have that big of an impact. It's the bigger picture is what you need to focus on the most. Now, as far as protein shakes or carbs and things like that, uh, utilize it to supplement your diet. Like in my case, 
if if I'm not getting enough solid food protein, then I'll make up for it with protein shakes, right? That's, but I, honestly, I don't really drink a lot of protein shakes. Very rare. Now, I will use protein powder in recipes because I enjoy it and it tastes good, and I can make some tasty, delicious recipes that make it easier to stick with my diet, like um, high protein ice cream that I use protein powder for, uh, high protein pancakes, high protein pudding, high protein cupcakes, high protein oatmeal. Hi, what other ones? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think that's pretty pancakes, oatmeal. But anyway, those, those are some of the basic ones, right? I'll utilize these high protein recipes because they taste delicious and they allow me to satisfy my sweet tooth craving with healthy, high protein, low sugar, low fat food options. So that's where I will use protein powder in my diet. Like very rare to actually have a protein shake anymore because you know, I, I don't get a lot of pleasure from just drinking a protein shake, but I do get eating pleasure and satisfaction from having a nice tasty high protein recipe like I just mentioned. And if you want a copy of that high protein recipe guide, uh, I'll post a link to it in the uh, video description of this video when I post up to replay, right? I, I've, I've shared this before, but it, it makes it so much easier to stick to a good diet plan when you have these healthy, tasty options there. So hopefully that helps to answer your question. I know it's kind of, it's not a specific qu answer, but it kind of gives you the mindset. Like it does not matter as long as your overall nutrition is in check, what you have right before or what you have right after your workout really doesn't matter. It, it's not that critical. All right. Um, okay. Robert's tuned in. We have space battleship. Alex is joining and he says, hi Lee, running and lifting. What are your thoughts? Okay. Running is running and lifting is lifting. What, I, I, that's kind of a very vague question. I, I don't, uh, unless you mean running and lifting simultaneously, which which would, if you literally did that, that would be uh, not good. Like I don't recommend running with dumbbells <laughs> or something like that. But if you enjoy running for your cardio and you enjoy lifting for your, your weight training, then that's fine. I personally am not a fan of running. I hate running because it's hard on the body. It's hard on the joints. You know, some people are built to run, and usually a genetically good runner is someone who is a very slim build, typically an ectomorph, someone who is naturally lean and slim and doesn't have a lot of weight to carry. Those are people who excel at running. People who are heavier, like heavier than average, are not good runners. They usually are the ones who have problems with knees and hips and ankles and shin splints and all that kind of stuff. All right, so... You know, you just just look at like a competitive runner. Most of those guys are like 150 pounds or less, right? You know, if you're over 200 pounds, like running's probably not the ideal form of cardio for you. I would recommend something more low impact for for people who are heavier. And if your goal is fat loss and you're overweight, definitely don't run, right? If you're just going to beat yourself up, right? I actually made a video about running uh, a few months ago on my YouTube channel. If you do a search for like Lee Hayward running, you should find it. I, I can't remember the exact title of the video, but if you scroll through my old videos, it, it's there. It's within the last year I posted it. So, But I'm a huge fan of lifting. I'm not a huge fan of running. I prefer lower impact cardio instead. All right. Where, where was I now? Um, next question. This one's from NOSMO. No SMO. <laughs> He says, I liked your video on going for 10 minute walks. And I like how you said in the video, uh, like, and like you said in the video, my 10 minute walk ended up being 45 minutes. Good for you. That's, that is the, the, like, I'm not saying that it always has to be that way, but that's what often happens. If you make the idea of exercise small in your mind and you just get started, then it's easier to continue on. Like the hardest part of exercise is just getting started. Like the, the hardest part of, of, of going to the gym is, is packing your gym bag and showing up to the gym, like walking into the door of the gym. That is the hardest part. If you can get that far, like you have your gym bag packed with all your stuff, you know, your workout gear, and, and you walk into the gym door, like the, the battle is won. Like that's 80% of the battle right there. Then the rest is like just coasting downhill to actually follow through and work out because you're already there. The hardest part is getting there. When it comes to doing cardio, whether that's like getting outside for a walk or a bicycle ride or, or whatever, the hardest part is like putting on your sneakers and getting out the door. 
<laughs> getting the ass off the couch and out the door. That is the hardest part. Like that's 80% right there. If you can get that far, the rest is easy. Like once an, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, right? An object at rest tends to stay at rest. So it's just getting that transition to happen. So, right, like say, you get your ass out the door. You, you commit to yourself mentally. Say like, I'm just going to go for a 10 minute walk. And then you get out the door and you start walking and then 10 minutes go by and you're like, hey, I actually like this. I'll keep going. Hey, I'll go for another five. Next thing you know, you, you went for 20 or, or in your case, you said you went for 45. But it, it, it's just like a mind trick that you can use to make it easier. Like just commit to doing something small. Right? If, if you have trouble going to the gym, say, look, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm only going to work out for, for, for 10 minutes. Right. I'm going to do 10 minutes of, of workout at the gym. I guarantee you, you'll probably do more. But by making it small in your mind, like thinking, I only have to do 10 minutes, it's easier to, to commit to that than if you say, well, I have to work out for two hours. Like nobody wants to go to the gym and work out for two hours unless you're, you know, a maniac. <laughs> but most people can commit to doing something small, right? That is a good strategy and it applies to so many things. Like even for, for writers, like if, if you are a writer, if you commit to say, well, I have to sit down and I have to, to, to write for two hours, like nobody wants to sit down and do that. But if you say, hey, I'm just going to write one paragraph, one paragraph, you can sit down and write a paragraph. And guess what? You write that one paragraph. Now you get, you're getting in the flow. You get your creative juices flowing. You probably write a couple more. You might write a page or two. And then that's how things happen. Just little bits at a time. It's the hardest part is just getting started. So that's where that strategy comes in. And for those of you who wonder what the heck am I talking about? <laughs> what video are we referring to? It's currently the, the main video on my YouTube channel right now. Like if you just go to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel, it's, it's the top video that plays automatically when you go there. Um, it's one where I talk about getting in shape for 2020. Uh, all right. Who else we got joining? I'm going to have a sip of water before we move on. Harry Bull joining in and he says, Lee, if I'm doing four sets of six reps at 60 kilograms next week, should I do four sets of seven reps? Yes, that would be a great form of progressive overload to try and increase the repetitions. Uh, what I would recommend for, for the majority of you watching this, especially if, if your goal is to build muscle, lose fat and get in shape is higher repetitions. I'm when you do low reps, like, you know, these five by five and these heavy power training type programs. I mean, yes, it can help. Yes, it's, it's, it can be productive, but it also increases your risk of injury. And unless you are trained for that type of lifting, you very often are not lifting with good form and optimal time under tension. And it's, it's not the best way to stimulate hypertrophy and build muscle and get in shape, right? It's, when you lift heavier and low reps, you tend to place more strain on the joints, tendons, and ligaments and less actual work on the muscles themselves, right? Because you're focusing on moving the weight from point A to point B rather than actually getting a good quality muscular contraction. When you lighten up the weight a little bit, increase the repetitions, get more time under tension, now it becomes less of less strain on the joints, tendons, and ligaments and more workload gets work placed on the muscles. So. It's better for hypertrophy, uh, for just getting in shape, you know, building muscle, burning fat, and all that. It tends to be better, and your, your risk of injury goes down significantly. So right now, I, I, I pers personally try to do higher repetitions. Like for me, a set of 10 reps is a heavy set. Like a set of 10 repetitions is a heavy low rep set for me at this stage of the game. And, and I usually try to do 15 or even higher for, for my repetitions for most of my exercises. And I find that that is a good range to be in for getting in shape. It works really well for most people. And if you're brand new to working out, then I would recommend keeping the repetitions higher, focus on the quality, not trying to lift super heavy weight because you need that time under tension in order to develop that mind muscle connection and to actually stimulate a hypertrophy response, building the muscle. When you do too low a reps and too heavy, again, you're straining the joints, tendons and ligaments and not so much for the muscle. If you're a competitive power lifter or strongman or something like that, then that's different, right? But, I, you know, I'm not gearing this towards competitive power lifters and strongmans. I'm gearing it towards people who want to build muscle, lose the gut, and get back in shape, right? That's the average person. That's who I'm gearing this to. Okay, who else we got? Uh, discernment 
queen, this discriminant queen. Oh, sorry, discriminant queen says hi. Hi. Uh, Abrams joining us. He says, lose all the weight and get skinny, then try to gain muscle or just start lifting heavy while losing the weight. Uh, lo lose all the weight and get skinny, then try to gain muscle or just start lifting heavy. Well, that, that, when it comes to losing fat, building muscle, and getting in shape, you can do it all simultaneously. Like, you don't have to lose all the weight first. Or you don't have to like build all the muscle first and get fatter. Like you can build muscle, you can burn fat, and you can do it at the same time. Like especially if if you are new to working out, especially if you're getting back to the gym after a layoff. Like it is possible. Even advanced lifters, advanced bodybuilders can still lose fat and build muscle simultaneously. Where you're, where this gets confusing is when people are thinking, "I want to bulk up." So let's just use an example. Let's say you're 150 pounds, uh, so you're skinny, but you still got a gut, right? You still got a, like if you lift up your shirt, you still got a soft belly roll hanging over your belt, even though you're skinny. So you're skinny fat. And they say, man, I'd love to be 175 pounds and ripped. So then you're wondering, well, what do I do, right? Do I try and get up, gain weight, or do I try to lose the fat? Like, what do I do? And you got to realize, like, if somebody is 150 pounds and skinny fat, going to 175 pounds and shredded, that's not something that's going to happen in, like, two or three months, right? Like, that's something that's going to happen in years. Like, that is a major, major physique transformation to gain that much muscle whilst burning body fat. Like, it's, it's not going to happen quickly. Like, even for a genetically gifted person who's you know, doing everything right, it's still going to take years to make that kind of a transformation. You're looking at like, again, it depends on the individual. Like if, if you're a teenager, obviously you're going to grow faster than someone who's in their forties, right? I mean, it's all relative, but it's still going to take time. So what you need to focus on is, is the, the bigger picture of increasing your lean muscle while losing body fat. So for example, again, we're, we're that 150 pounds, we're, we're skinny fat, uh, like you can lose 10 pounds of body fat while simultaneously gaining two to three pounds of lean muscle tissue. Like that's very realistic and, and achievable in, in a short term training phase for, for anybody who's focusing on proper training and nutrition. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking at improving your body composition, right? Losing the fat, building muscle at the same time. And then of course, if, if depending on how far you want to take it, you just, you got to train longer, right? In order to reach your ultimate goal, but you just focus on that improving your body composition and and just let the consistency and, and and the time handle the rest right if your goal is to be a huge jacked bodybuilder then it's going to take years like in my case it took me five years of training before i got to the point where i could compete in my first novice level competition and even then i sucked i got my ass kicked on stage right most people who look like they work out I and mean, when you see them and they're like big and jacked and ripped and they're like, man, I'd like to look like that guy. They've been training for a decade or more. Like that's the reality of it. Anybody who tries to say, oh, you can do it in a matter of a couple months. It, it's, it's not realistic. Like it takes time to, to build that kind of muscle. It, I'm talking about the type of muscle where you know, like you're looking at your, your fitness influencers on social media, you know, the guys who you look up to and you're like, man, I'd love to look like that guy. Most of these guys have been training for at least a decade. You know, some more, some less. It really all depends on the, on the age group. Obviously, if you're following younger guys and they're, you know, let's just say you're following someone who's 25 years old, I can guarantee he probably started training as a teenager. So he's still got, you know, five to 10 years of training under his belt. And then if you're following older guys who are in their 40s, 50s or beyond, they probably got 20 or more years of training under their belt, right? That's just the reality of it. All right. I just kind of went off on a tangent there with that one. <laughs> I sometimes do. <laughs> but hopefully you find it beneficial, right? Hopefully you do. Okay, let's move on. Where was I with that? Um, the reps, the gain and the weight. All right. We have Nav786 who says hi, and I'll say hi back to you. Woodyulos, a regular, is joining in. He says, Happy New Year from Scotland. Any tips for training in a super busy gym for the month of January? Do the best you can. I mean, it, that's, that is really going to depend on the gym and 
where you're located and everything else. I mean, most gyms are going to get busier in January. So ideally, if you could, you would schedule your workouts in the non-peak times. Like the peak times for the gym is usually the after work time, say from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. In the, in the evening, afternoon, that's like probably the peak. Uh, in the morning is probably like the second peak, like before nine o'clock or, you know, like in the, say from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. That range is probably the second peak. Uh, then you might have another little mini peak around lunch break, you know, people getting in for their lunch hour. Uh, but if you can kind of train at non-peak times, that would be ideal if you could make that work right? Like train mid morning, mid afternoon, later in the evening, non-peak times, you would probably be better off in terms of less people at the gym. Now I know that's not always possible. And sometimes just due to your schedule, you have to go in there when it's at peak time. And in those situations, it's, it's going to be tough, right? Especially if you live in a bigger city and, and, and you know, it's, it, you know, when, when the new year's boom hits, like the gym can like double in, in, in membership or something like that. And you're really like crowded. One thing that I would suggest, don't get hung up on the exercises, focus on training the muscles. And what I mean by this, let's say you've got your written program and maybe you're following my New Year's Get Back in Shape program that I just posted up on YouTube the other day. And the first exercise is a seated row, right? A seated row machine. And maybe you like to do the seated cable row. But you go to the gym and the seated cable row is busy and you're like, shit, I can't do that. Then you might be able to do like a, a one arm dumbbell row instead or maybe a barbell row. Or maybe you'll be able to go over and use the T-bar row machine or the hammer strength seated row. Like do another rowing variation instead. Don't get hung up on the particular exercise. Focus on working the muscle. So that's a good tip for New Year's when the gym is extra busy. Uh, the same thing, like the next exercise is a chest press. Well, maybe the chest press machine is busy, but you could do push-ups, right? That's the same exercise. It's basically a bodyweight chest press. Maybe, you know, if you want to do a barbell bench press, but the bench press is busy, maybe you could go over and do a dumbbell bench press instead. Or maybe you could do your bench presses on the hammer strength machine or, or whatever, right? You, you like have flexibility and focus on working the muscle and not getting hung up on the exercise. Um, and and if, if you do that, then granted, your, your workout is not going to be spot on according to your pre-planned program that you have written out on paper, but you're still going to get in a good workout and you're not going to be standing around waiting on machines. Like I would rather change the exercise than, than stand around waiting on the machine. Like let's just say I wanted to do bench press and, you know, there's, there's a guy like the bench presses are all full. I wouldn't want to just stand around for five or ten minutes waiting for the bench press to be free before I do an exercise. Like I would go do something else instead or at least have the flexibility to change the order of your exercises. So you go and do something later in the program and then come back and do the bench press later when it's free. Like have flexibility with your program. That will help a lot in New Year's. You know, don't be so anal and rigid thinking I have to do everything on my program in the exact order and the exact exercise or it, it's going to suck and life is terrible. No, just just work out. Right. Don't don't be so rigid, like have flexibility and, and change up the variations and stuff. And so you can work around the busy crowd. All right, there, hopefully that helps. Uh, Mac games is joining us and he's got a waving hand in there. So I'll give him a wave back. Uh, Dan 84 is asking, can I get some gains with machines? Absolutely. You can get gains with machines. Like anything you do consistently and train with progressive overload, like you're going to make progress. You can make gains with machines. And in fact, the, the new workout program that I'm folks that I post up, it's geared towards beginners who are trying to get back in shape, whether you're, you're, you've been off the gym for several months and, and you need to get back into a routine again, or maybe you've never started working out. This is your brand new. I always recommend people who are new to the gym, start with machines because one, machines are easier to learn. Like the, the machine balances and supports the weight and it's on a guided track and everything else. So like they're, they're, the odds of you screwing up are less when you use a machine because the machine is going to keep you on track, right? It's like riding a bicycle with training wheels. Like the odds of you falling over with training wheels are a lot less than if you are on a bike with no training wheels. Right, you start with machines. Get used to that. Like train with progressive overload, stimulate the muscle, get time under tension, all that good stuff with the machines. 
Then as you get more advanced, we can move into the free weight exercises and the body weight exercises and the more challenging moves as you get better. Just like with a kid learning how to ride a bicycle, like they start off with a trike, right? A, a tricycle. As, as they get more confident, okay, now they're on a two-wheel bike with, with stabilizers, with training wheels, and they, they get used to that. And once they're confident with that, okay, now we can take the training wheels off, right? And it, same with your workouts, right? Start with the basics, and then we'll build it up as, as your work capacity and fitness level increase. Don't always start with the, the hardest variation from the get-go, because you'll probably end up injuring yourself and setting yourself back, right? You don't take a kid who don't know how to ride a bike and throw them on a on a two-wheel bicycle and send them flying down a hill because they're just going to wipe out and hurt themselves and never want to ride a bike again, right? <laughs> Same thing with working out, right? Start with basics and build up gradually. Um, let's see what else we got. Nav786 says, I turned 40 last year and found that your YouTube channel has been very helpful and motivating. Thanks. You're very welcome, Mr. Nav. I'm glad you enjoy that. And, and that's, you know, you are my, like men over 40 who, who are trying to lose the gut, build muscle, get back in shape and, and prioritize their own health and fitness as they transition into that second half of life. Like that's who I'm talking to. That That's who I am. I'm at, That's where I'm at, at my in my own personal fitness. And that's who I'm gearing these videos to and who I really want to target is because this is what I see so often. Like so many men especially people who have families, uh, you, you know, you, you're prioritizing everybody else in your life and your own health and fitness gets pushed down the, le the down, down in priority. Like you're, you're spending time working your job. You're spending time looking after your family. You're spending time taking care of the kids. And, and so everybody else can do their thing. Right. And, and you're working your ass off to put my, you know, you're the breadwinner, right? You put food on the table, roof over the head, everything. Make sure everybody's happy and comfortable, but your health and fitness gets pushed down the line, right? Because you don't have time to go to the gym. You don't have time to eat right. And it just gets pushed further and further down. I, I, I understand the motiv motivation behind that, but it, it's, not, it's not a healthy solution. You have to turn things around because if you neglect your own health and fitness, it's like neglecting the maintenance on your car, right? The check engine lights on, the car is burning oil, the, the brakes are squeaking, but you say, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to keep going. I don't have time to fix it right now. I'm going to keep going. It's okay. And next thing you know, you're going down the highway and the car craps out, right? The car breaks down. And because you've been neglecting the maintenance so long, what might have been a simple repair job at the at the garage now turns into the, the car shit hole. Like you need the motor's blown. You know, you know, you need a new motor or, or it's, it's beyond repair at this stage and you need a new car. Well, that's okay if it's a car because, you know, you can always fix your car. You can always get a new car, whatever, right? Cars are replaceable. Your body is not. So if you're getting warning signs, you're overweight, you have high blood pressure, right? You have high cholesterol, your high blood sugar, right? Low energy, low libido, all these warning signs, all these check engine lights are coming on in your body telling you, hey, hey, fatty, wake up. You need to take care of me, right? I'm, I'm slowly dying here. Right? You have all these warning signs and you keep neglecting them. You say, oh, I'll get around to it later. When I'm not so busy, I'm going to take care of my health. Right? Guess what happens? Eventually, you're just like you're driving that car down the highway with, you know, check engine light on, burning oil, squealing brakes. Everything's wrong with it. Eventually, it's going to crap out. Right? You're going to have a heart attack. You're going to have a stroke, diabetes, cancer. Like something's going to give and you may not always get a second chance. Right. Sometimes you do. Right. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you're lucky enough. You get a second chance and you can turn it around. Sometimes you don't. Right. Um, I mean, I, I've known people personally. I've had family members. Right. Drop dead of a heart attack. Right. Have a stroke. Can't recover from it. You know, it's it's it's, it's sad, but it's it's reality of life. We all know people who are in that situation. You don't want to be there because you know, like, if, if you're the man of the house, the breadwinner, the, the provider for the family, and then all of a sudden you get sick you die, something happens, then guess what? You're not helping anybody, right? Even if you don't die, but you get sick and you have an illness, now all of a sudden you go from being the provider to the family to a burden on the family, right? You're not helping. Now they have to spend all their time and energy looking after you because, you know, whatever thing's wrong with you. Like I, I, I've had friends and family members, like 
diabetes is a serious disease. And I, uh, a, a friend of the family recently, you know, had to have his leg amputated because of diabetes. Now, just think of all the shit and, and, and trouble that he just caused his family because he neglected his diet and exercise over the years and got to the point where diabetes and his leg amputated. I mean, they had to spend thousands of dollars to renovate the house to make it wheelchair accessible. Thousands of dollars in health care and medical bills leading up until that. And he's probably going to die in a few years anyway. So, I mean, he went from being the man of the house, the provider, everything else, to now he's the biggest burden in the house because he's neglected his health and fitness. So if you don't want to be the biggest burden to your family, where now instead of them being able to do their own thing, they have to focus on babysitting you, like you have to take care of your own health and fitness while you can, just like taking care of the maintenance on your car while you still can. So that's why I'm so passionate about helping guys who are, over 40 in that second half of life because so many of us have gotten to the point where we're neglecting our health and fitness and guess what i was guilty of that too just a few years ago right when my son was born i got to the point where i was saying like yeah like i know i should exercise i know i should go to the gym i know i should eat right like i knew what to do i was a competitive bodybuilder for 20 years i knew what i had to do but i was just too damn lazy to do it and then finally, I came up with a realistic system that allows me to make progress without being perfect, right? That's that's the whole way that I, I focus on. Like kind of earlier when we were talking about, you know, breaking it down, making it small and easy to get started. Like instead of thinking you have to go to the gym for two hours, hey, just go for 10 minutes. Like, you know, 10 minutes is better than no minutes. Little things like that. You know, don't be perfect with your diet, but just be a little bit better simple things like that can turn the tables around. And that's what I'm really focusing on now is just helping guys to turn their stuff around so that they don't have to be that burden on the family. You know, they can be the, the man of the house and the provider for many years to come. Anyway, that was a long winded rant there, <laughs> but it's something I'm passionate about. Let's move on. Um, uh, Junk Drawer is saying, do you have any advice on high, high hamstring tendonitis? A high hamstring tendonitis. I've never had hamstring tendonitis. I've pulled my hamstrings and strained them before, but I've never really had a hamstring tendonitis. So I can't really speak from personal experience on that one. You kind of got me stumped there. Uh, Dan84 is saying, are pull-ups enough for the back alone? Pull-ups are great. They're one of my favorite back exercises, but I wouldn't say they're enough to do alone because a pull-up is only working the upper back. It's working the lats and all the supporting muscles, but you're neglecting a lot. Like there's no lower back activation with a pull-up. Uh, you know, you're getting very little from the, the trapezius point, like in the terms of a shrugging movement because it's all just an overhead pull. Uh, so no, it's not enough. Like ideally you want to work the body from all the major planes of motion, right? So I mean, ultimately, when it comes to the back, you have an overhead pull, you have a horizontal pull, you have some sort of arching, like whether it's a deadlift or a good morning or a hyperextension. Uh, and then you also have a shrugging movement because technically traps are part of the back, right? So if you want a complete back workout over the course of, of your training program, you need to include those exercises to some, some way, shape or form. Now, I'm not saying like a, a beginner who's just getting started has to do all this stuff. But as you progress through your workouts, you need to incorporate phases and exercises where you are hitting your back from an overhead pull, a horizontal pull, some sort of arching, deadlifting, good morning type of exercise, as well as some sort of shrugging exercise, right? You need to incorporate all those different movement patterns to hit the complete back. Chris is joining in and he's saying, happy 2020, Lee. Any idea what causes plantar fascia? I think it might be plantar fasciitis, I guess it is. Uh, does it just go away? It's affecting my cardio. I, I've never really dealt with that myself, so I don't have any personal uh, tips or strategies. One thing that's going to make a big difference, though, obviously the, the, the footwear that you wear, uh, the type of cardio that you do, like obviously a higher impact cardio is going to be a lot harder than a lower impact cardio. Um, what I would recommend for someone who has any foot problems, whether it's plantar fasciitis or, or, or just feet pain in general, low impact cardio, good footwear. Go get yourself new new sneakers, you know, 
lots of padding, cushioning, right? Don't don't cheap out and buy like shitty sneakers. Like the sneakers you wear for weight training are not necessarily the best sneakers for cardio and vice versa. Like good sneakers for cardio would have thick padding and cushioning and good arch support and all that stuff. Uh, the shoes that you would wear for weight training ideally would just be a, a, a flat, solid sole shoe. So you, you might want to have two pairs of sneakers. If you're really serious about this and you're having foot problems, you may have a pair for your workouts, a pair for your cardio. And uh, that would definitely help. But lower impact cardio. So the elliptical, the stationary bike, uh, that would definitely help for, for working around this uh, versus trying to do high impact cardio like running or even walking for that matter. Because walking, you know, even though it's not as high impact as, as running, it still has impact. Uh, or, or the Stairmaster or something like that where you have constantly have that, you know, your feet hitting the ground every stride. Something where your feet are supported like the elliptical or the bike could definitely help in this case. And who else we got? Ja, ja, la, ja, 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 la, J A L A L is saying, can you, can you depend on oat as your only source of carbs? I think you asked that question last week because that looks vaguely familiar or very familiar, I should say, <laughs> um, or someone asked me that. No, I wouldn't rely on oats as your only source of carbs. Like, why Why do you want to have just one source of carbohydrates? We have a whole, there's all kinds of foods. Like, I mean, oats is a great source of carbohydrate. Don't get me wrong. I like oats, but I like a lot of other stuff too. I like fruits. I like vegetables. I like potatoes. I like rice. I, I mean, why limit yourself to one source of food? Unless you're like on a, like you're dead ass broke and that's the only thing you can afford. If that's the case, then okay, do the best you can. But ideally have a wide variety of food in your diet just don't think of one thing it's like it's like asking like oh i can i only have one exercise like why do you just want to limit yourself to one exercise right you have a whole gym full of exercise equipment like take advantage of it like why do you want to limit yourself to one source of carbohydrates we have a lot of food available like take advantage of it life would get awful boring if you only ate oatmeal for the rest of your life <laughs> all right let's see um, so we got uh, Dave. Oh, where was it? Too? I that's my thing. Shh, where was I? I'm losing my uh, spot here. It seems like when the video chat uploads or, or refreshes, I sometimes lose my spot. Where was I? Too? Um, is that I don't know. My, my screen just refreshed on me and I lost my spot. Just give me a second, guys. What was that? We were talking about oatmeal. Where it was oats. Where's the question about oats? All right, here. Uh, David Jones is saying, I gotta say, Lee, one of the best YouTube fitness channels out there. No bullshit. You always tell the truth. Oh, I appreciate it, Dave. Thanks for that. I mean, I, I have a small channel, obviously. I mean, somebody already commented on I have a sm very small channel, but I'd rather have a small channel that people enjoy versus a big channel that people hate. <laughs> so, again, thanks for your comment. Glad you enjoy it. Uh, we have Nick saying, yo, bro, what's up, man? Hey, bro, bro, you look shredded. Well, I, I wouldn't say I'm shredded, but thanks. <laughs> thanks for tuning in, bro. Happy New Year to you. We've got Captain Crunch. Got to love these usernames. Captain Crunch is saying, I notice everyone recommends full body workouts, but I, but I seem to make more progress with a five-day split. Am I missing out on something? If you're making progress on a five-day split, you enjoy a five-day split, then guess what? You do a five-day split. That's it. Like, seriously, do what works for you. Like, I'll, I'll break it down for you. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you my take on it. If you are one of these people who struggle to be consistent with your workouts and you, you don't have five days to go to the gym each week or more, right? Some people go to the gym every day. Like, if you don't have five plus days a week to go to the gym and you're, you're out pressed for time, then that's where doing a full body workout or maybe like a push pull split or, or upper lower split or something like that makes sense because it'll allow you to get more training frequency over the course of the week. Because like, let's just say you're doing, you, you break up your workouts over five days and you can only get to the gym twice a week. It's going to take you like three weeks before you hit all your major muscle groups because of the way the split is. I mean, that's not optimal at all. Whereas if you were doing full body, or upper lower, at least you're hitting the entire body, you know, once or twice a week, if you're only getting to the gym a couple times a week. So that that's the reasoning behind it. If you are 
press for time. You can't make it to the gym as often as you would like. And, you know, you're only getting there, you know, two or three times a week. Then it makes sense to train multiple muscle groups per workout so that you're getting more efficiency and, and you're getting more frequency. Now, if you have five or, or six days a week to go to the gym, then you can split it up so that you're training different muscle groups on different days, doing more exercise variety and all that kind of stuff. Because over the course of the week, you're going to hit all your major muscle groups and you're going to get a decent level of frequency because the fact that you're just going to the gym more often. So it, it really depends on you, your schedule, and of course, what your body responds to. Now, I, I've seen some guys make phenomenal progress doing a split routine. Like most bodybuilders, you know, will, will do split routines and, and make great progress with it. I mean, it works. <laughs> like as long as anything you do consistently is works, right? Anything's better than nothing. But in some cases, it makes more sense to do full body or a, a split where you're training multiple muscle groups in a single workout. And again, it depends on you, your schedule, your, your fitness level, your recovery, what it is you're training for. I mean, there, th that's one thing that pisses me off is like some people give these one size fits all recommendations saying, oh, everybody should do full body. Everybody should do push pull legs. Everybody should do a, a, a five day split or no, it, you can't give random generalizations. It's like the, going to the doctor and saying, I'm sick. And he says, everybody should take the same drugs. <laughs> no, you don't give everybody the same drugs. You diagnose their situation and see what their ailments are, right? You don't give somebody with high blood pressure. You don't give them, you know, uh, insulin to lower. <laughs> like Blood pressure and blood sugar are not the same thing. So you don't, it's not like trying to prescribe the same workout or the same diet to everybody. is like the doctor prescribing the same drugs to everybody. It doesn't work that way. You have to look at the individual, their problems, their situation, what they're trying to improve and diagnose their situation accordingly, right? So that's why I, I it, it just drives me nuts when I see people say, oh, everybody should follow low carb keto diet or everybody should go vegan or everybody should do total body or everybody should do this. Like, no, it's not appropriate for everybody. You have to customize it to the individual and what it is they're training for and how old they are and their fitness level and injuries and mobility issues. I mean, there, there's so much that goes into designing a program for somebody. It's not just like cookie cutter, copy paste, everybody, the same thing. Ah, there we go. Nick says, I bet I could take you in a scrap. You know what? You probably could, Nick. You probably could. But guess what? I'm not going to get in a scrap with you. Uh, what else we got? Aaron's joining in. Hey, Aaron, how's it going? Aaron's one of our coaching students in the uh, Muscle After 40 program, and he's made some great progress over the past few months. So, again, thanks. I'm glad you're tuning in. Uh, Messina, M-A-S-I-N-A, Messina, I think it is. What is the best way to use whey protein uh, orally? <laughs> It, it, it really doesn't matter. Like you could have a protein shake. That's fine. You, you can use protein powder in recipes. That's fine. Uh, I tell you what, I'm going to post a link. I've already mentioned this earlier in our video chat, but I'm going to post a link to my high protein recipe guide. And this uses whey protein as the base for some delicious recipes that you can make. Uh, again, high protein ice cream, high protein pudding, high protein cupcakes, high protein oatmeal, high protein pancakes, like delicious recipes, good food that you can make using protein powder that will actually help you with your muscle building and fat loss goals. So I'm going to share that in, in the description of this. When the replay is posted up afterwards, I'll, I'll put the link there. I'll put it up in the cards and all that good stuff. But uh, that's one way that I personally use whey protein is I use it in recipes. Now, of course, you could have just the protein shake alone. There's nothing wrong with that, but I I don't get much eating satisfaction out of a protein shake. It's like you drink it and it's gone, right? I like to actually get eating satisfaction from my food because I find when you enjoy it, you get eating satisfaction. It satiates your appetite more and fills you up, right? Like I don't get full from a protein shake. Like if I ate a chicken breast or I drank a protein shake, like I get the chicken breast, I'm chewing it, I'm eating it. It's actually filling up my belly more. When I drink the protein shake, it's just like gulp gone and I'm still like, you know, I'm looking for something to eat. So I like to eat my protein versus drink it. And I find that that's a great strategy for controlling my caloric intake, helping me to stay, you know, in a calorie deficit or even closer to calorie maintenance, which is where I strive to be. I like to be at either a maintenance or a slight deficit because I want to kind of get leaner. 
uh, I don't want to be in a surplus. Now, if, for someone who wants to be in a surplus, then drinking protein shakes is a great way to do it because it's easier to consume liquid calories. Uh, you know, if, if you want to eat more and drink, you can drink your, your, your calories and consume more of them and put you in a surplus easier. So again, it depends on the situation, it depends on the individual, your goals and all that stuff. The best way is what's right for you. And again, I need to know more about you and your situation in order to tell you what's right for you. And if you would like to discuss that with me, uh, send me an email, leeh at leehayward.com, and we can chat and we can come up with a strategy that's right for you. We have Cody the Jedi is joining in. He says, what would be a good natural goal for a five foot seven male with small joints with a six pack? I don't know. What, what do you, what do you, what would be a good natural ghost? Oh, what would be a, I, I skipped a word, goal weight. Again, how much weight, how, how much you should weigh at five foot seven really depends on your body structure and, and everything else. Like I'm five foot six and a half. So let's, let's go crazy and round it up to five foot seven. I'm uh, right now, uh, last I stepped on the scale, I'm 198, right? There, that could be a, a good goal if you want, but some people have a, a different body structure. Like I'm kind of a, a stockier structure than, than some people. So it depends. Like if you have more of an ectomorphic structure, then maybe your, your body is not going to hand carry that much mass. If you have a, a heavier, fatter structure, maybe you will, right? Like I kind of have meso endo characteristics. Like if I don't focus on my diet and my cardio, I get fat really easy. Right. I, I just I have it's a constant battle for me to stay lean. Like I have to constantly exert conscious effort to keep the weight off. Other people is the opposite. Like they have to exert conscious effort to keep the weight on. Right. They have to constantly be eating and or, or else they, they lose weight and get skinny. Like I'm not that type of guy. Right. I don't. But my default setting isn't get skinny. My default setting is get fat. So I, I'm a what's a good natural weight for me is probably different than a good natural weight for somebody else or vice versa. So it really depends on you, Cody, the Jedi. Uh, if you want to chat about it, send me an email again, Lee H at Lee Hayward.com. That's my personal email address. And we can ch chat about a strategy that would be right for you. Uh, we have Farid joining us. I believe is also Jacob because I've chatted with him. He's joining in from Thailand. Uh, who else is joining in? A.T. at Rayson, I think it is, at Rayson, says, for military members, what are good exercises to help with ruck marches? I really don't know. I've never had any experience with ruck marches, so I, I, I'm i not a good person to ask on that. Uh, Dave Cooper is saying, Lee, I've been doing exercise bike at home and at the gym 30 minutes each time, six days per week, which I've made pretty good progress to begin with, but weight loss has slowed down. Do I need to increase the times, mix up the equipment, etc.? All right. You're at a plateau with your fat loss. You need to do one of two things. You need to exercise more or eat less. That's, I know that's very simplistic and basic, but it's ultimately it's true. Like you, you need to create a bigger calorie deficit. So there, there's a couple ways to go about it. You could stick with your six days per week of 30 minutes of cardio, and you could do that cardio at a faster pace, higher intensity, and burn more calories per session. That would work. That would increase your calorie deficit. Uh, you could, excuse me, I'm having a burp here. Uh, you could do a longer session, like you could bump it up to 35 minutes and see how it works. And then if that you hit a plateau, you could bump it up to 40 minutes and try to 45 minutes, whatever. I mean, you, you could do that. Uh, you could tighten up your diet. You could look at your overall eating and see, okay, where can I tighten it up? Honestly, again, with without knowing everything about you and your whole situation, I would look for your nutrition first because almost everybody, almost everybody can improve their diet. Like, I can improve my diet. I'm I'm not perfect, right? I, I eat too much crap sometimes. Like over the holidays, I put on five pounds, right? So I can improve my diet. Like some, even if you're eating good, healthy food, like you're eating protein and veggies and complex carbohydrates and, you know, all the good, healthy stuff, you can sometimes eat too much of the good, healthy stuff. And that can, and it doesn't take much. Like, you know, a, uh, what could determine whether you're actually losing fat or not? It could be as, as small as a couple hundred calories a day. 
like literally. So, I mean, you could either burn a couple hundred calories more with cardio or exercise, or you could cut back a couple hundred calories with your diet. And all of a sudden now, what was once a plateau starts to be steady progress all over again. So it's, it's sometimes like your progress could be like sitting on the edge of a knife, right? Like you could go one way and you're like, oh shit, I'm not plateaued. I'm not making any progress. Or you could go the other way and like, man, this is awesome, right? I'm getting leaner week after week. I'm making progress. So like sometimes you're, you're literally like teeter tottering right on that edge. So what I would suggest is like teeter totter to the good edge, <laughs> right? Cut back on the calories a few and, uh, and, and probably bump up the cardio, but start with the, start with the diet first. Like, look where you can clean it up. Like, if, if there's anything obvious in there, alcohol, sweets, junk, you know, stuff like that, minimize that first and then uh, bump up the cardio afterwards. What do we got? We got some super chats coming through here. This is cool. What do we got here? I like, I've seen that the $10 just come in. Thank you for whoever. That is from Marquias Muna, sent a $10 tip. And he said, You said you're five foot six and a half. I'm no longer alone in the short man life. Wow. I got paid for being short. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, man, like I, I'm a, what, what do they call it? A manlet, is it? You know, a manlet with muscles? Like I'm, I'm short. Like, you know, of course, when, when you're alone on camera, like nobody knows how tall you are. But when I'm standing in, in a group of people, like, like that's the way I am. Like uh, m most people are, are taller than me, except everybody in my family is short. Like I'm, I'm of the tallest in my family. So like people say, oh, you're working out and that's why you're short because you, you worked out and you stunted your growth. Like, no, that doesn't work that way. Like that's a crock of BS. It's a myth. Like Lou Ferrigno is six foot five and he started working out as a teenager, right? Like if, if, if working out stunts your growth, then he would be, you know, five foot five, but he's six foot five. So, I mean, no, it doesn't work that way. Your, your height is determined by your genetics. And like in my case, everybody in my family is short. We're all uh, like I, I'm. I'm this just as tall or taller than than everybody in in my family. You know, so it's 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 all genetics. It's got nothing to do with working out and stunting your growth or any of that crap. All right, where else was I to? I lost my place. Um, okay, I was talking about Dave and some strategies for him to get past his plateau. Spaceship battle. Alex is asking. Um, Sorry for the ambiguity of my question, but you got my gist. Okay, cool. All right, that was just a follow-up to a previous question. Uh, baby boomer fitnesses, can working out every day lower your testosterone levels? It it depends. I mean, it's, it, there, again, there's, there's so many variables. I mean, working out every day could increase your testosterone levels if you're doing it and you're recovering properly. But if you get to the point where you're overtraining, you are breaking your body down faster than it can recover, then that can have a negative impact on your hormones. But if, if you are getting adequate rest, recovery, nutrition, all that stuff, uh, daily exercise is not going to hinder your testosterone. And if you do daily exercise the way I recommend daily exercise, it's going to help. The way I recommend daily exercise is my yin and yang training system. Sounds fancy and mystical, but it's, it's really quite simple. One day I do weight training high intensity weight training and, and high intensity weight training doesn't mean you're, you're training like a maniac or anything like that. It means you're, you're, you're training smart with progressive overload and you actually push yourself in the gym. doesn't mean you push beyond your limits, but you, you push yourself to the point where, you know, you're, you're straining to lift weight. You know, it's, it's not a walk in the park, right? I'm not curling pink dumbbells. I'm actually working and, and exerting some effort. So that's high intensity weight training. Uh, and then on my off days, I do some cardio right? Walking, cycling, cardio machines, swimming, whatever, like do some sort of cardio. It's usually low intensity, longer duration cardio. That's what I do. And I alternate high intensity weight training, low intensity cardio, high intensity weight training, low intensity cardio. And that's my yin and yang, right? I have the high intensity and then the, the low intensity. So it's, you know, the, the dark, uh, aggressive exercise, and then you have the gentle exercise and, and the complementary of doing alternating them day for day, it allows me to exercise every day, but still recover, still burn fat and calories every day, but still recover and, and improve my health and fitness in the process. So that's what I, I do personally. That's what I recommend to a lot of my coaching students. You know, one day weight training, the next day cardio, one day weight training, the next day cardio. It's, it's a phenomenal, brilliant system. It's brilliant because it's so simple and it's so easy to do. And sometimes simplicity is, is brilliant. And that's what I, I like. So it's that's what I personally do, and I find it works really well for everyday 
exercise while still improving your overall health, fitness, hormone response, all that good stuff. Tony is joining us. He says he's currently bulking. How often should I increase my calorie intake? How much weight should I gain per month? I'm 118 and I want to be 135. All right. The... Okay, that, that's a loaded question in a way. When it comes to bulking, I, I'm not a fan of the, the traditional bulk where you just see food, eat food, try to gain weight as fast as possible. Focus on quality over quantity. I would much rather you gain like one pound a month and have that be good quality mass than gain five or 10 pounds a month and have like 75% of that be body fat, right? Because getting fat doesn't help. I mean, yes, okay. I mean, for someone who's skinny, like, okay, 118 pounds is kind of, you know, on the skinny side. And you, you're probably like, man, I just want to get bigger. I just want to get bigger. I want to fill up my clothes, right? I just, and okay, yeah, that's great. But the problem is, let's just say you go on the, the, the dirty bulk diet, right? Your pizza and burgers and fries and ice cream and potato chips, and you just eat and eat and eat and just gain weight. You're going to gain a lot of body fat. And yes, you're going to fill out your clothes. Yes, the scale weight's going to go up. And that may short term improve your confidence. But then come next summer, right, when it's time to hit the beach and time to take your shirt off, now you're 135 pounds, but you got a gut, this soft, mushy gut hanging over your belt. And now you're embarrassed to take your shirt off at the pool or at the beach because now not only are you still kind of skinny, but now you're fat too. So now you're skinny fat. Like I'd rather be skinny and shredded than skinny fat because at least then when you take your shirt off when you're skinny shredded, you look good, right? But if you take your shirt off when you're skinny fat, you, you, you don't look good, right? Like fat doesn't look good. <laughs> it just doesn't. So... I would rather you make lean quality gains, slow quality gains. And uh, so uh, ideally, how I would structure a bulk, and I, I use that in quotations because it's I don't like that word bulk, focus your diet just the same as if you were doing a fat loss program, just the same as if you were trying to cut and get shredded. The only thing is you're going to bump up the calories so that you're in a very slight surplus, like I mean, 10% surplus. So let's just throw some numbers out there. Let's say your, your maintenance calories is 2,000. Let's start off with a 10% surplus, 2,200. Start there and, and, and just see how your body responds. If you're gaining like a, a pound or two a month and it's good quality weight and you're staying lean and you feel good and you're getting good workouts, then, you know, keep that up until, until you hit a plateau, right? But focus on slow quality gains, Right. The biggest mistake a lot of people make is they try to bulk up too fast. And while that gives them the short term confidence of they're getting on the scale and the weight's going up and they're, they're feeling stronger in the gym, because even if you gain fat and you just have more mass like that helps to increase your strength. That's why like a lot of powerlifters and strongman competitors are fat because it helps to make them stronger. Right. Just just more mass will increase your strength. Right. I mean, so if, if that's your goal and great, but if, if your goal is to actually look good, then no, that's not great. So. Focus on quality over quantity because this is going to prevent you from having to bulk up, get a fat, and then all of a sudden you say, oh, I don't like the way I look because I'm too fat. And then you have to diet down. And then when you diet down, you might risk, you know, losing muscle in the process. And it's just this vicious cycle, right? Like I'd rather you slow and steady move in the right direction, like slow, steady muscle gains so that you're staying lean, filling out your frame and you get to your ideal weight eventually. I mean, it's probably going to take a while. It's not like something that's going to happen overnight, right? You know, it's going to take months, maybe even years of, of good consistent progress to get to your ultimate goal. But you get there and then you're you're happy with the way you look versus get there and be too fat. And then you're like, oh, I got to diet down. And you're yo-yoing up, up and down with your weight and all that kind of... It just... Slow and steady, make some, some quality gains. But again, start with a 10% surplus, keep the food, good high quality food. I mean, if you're looking for a macro split, keep it simple. Start off with 30% uh, protein, you know, one third protein, one third carbs, one third fat. Like keep it that one third ratio with a 10% surplus and that should move you in the right direction. Uh, Ray is saying six small meals versus intermittent fasting. I personally would go with somewhere in the middle, 
right? I've done intermittent fasting. I mean, both can work. Don't get me wrong. Like the overall food in and out is what's going to matter at, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, like it's the overall average that matters the most, not how often you break it up. But ideally somewhere in the middle, I would say four, like personally, I probably eat on average four times a day, breakfast before bed. And then I have a couple meals in between there. <laughs> like that's, that's usually the way I do it. Right. And that, that works, works well for me because space it out. Right. Like I, I find if I, I've done the intermittent fasting thing and it does work, don't get me wrong. It does work. But what I found as I got deeper into intermittent fasting is I, my, my appetite would increase to the point where once I started my feeding window, right. Whatever, however you break it up, whether that's one meal a day or, or you have like a 16, uh, eight, fast where you fast for 16 hours and eat for eight hours or however the heck you break it off. I found once I entered my feeding window after fasting and depleting myself for so long, my, I couldn't control my appetite. So I'd end up overeating within my feeding window and I was, it made it harder to actually stay in a calorie deficit. So what I ended up doing is I switched back to eating more frequently and having a more stable blood sugar throughout the day. And I found that that made it easier for me to maintain a calorie deficit because I wasn't getting the energy highs and lows and spikes and all that stuff. So I personally would rather more consistent, stable energy versus the, the spikes. Uh, that, that's my personal preference. And from a bodybuilding, muscle building point of view, I think it's a better way to go. But with that being said, you, you can make intermittent fasting work. Like I did follow it for several months and did see significant progress with it. So again, it's not that one is really right or wrong. It, it's what do you enjoy personally? What fits your schedule personally? And uh, what can you stick with? Like the best diet is the one that you stick with, regardless of what the study says, regardless of what Joe Blow YouTuber says, or, or Mr. Muscle Instagram says, what you can stick with and do consistently is going to work 10 times better than the, the the most complicated program on paper that you don't follow consistently, right? So it's the best diet is the one that you can actually stick with. <laughs> all right, we got Tyler's tuned in saying, Lee, who's your favorite bodybuilder of all time? Tell us some IB, IFBB pros that you know. Um, my favorite bodybuilder of all time, I'd have to say Dorian Yates. He was Mr. Olympia when I was a teenager starting to compete. You know, he was the reigning Mr. Olympia when I was right in the heyday of bodybuilding. I was all full of piss and vinegar and excited about bodybuilding. So I have huge respect for Dorian. But I, the, the thing I like about Dorian is how he's transitioned after bodybuilding and kind of went to a normal life afterwards. I have a lot of respect for that, you know, because he, he's a prime example of, of changing your approach based on you, your situation, your goals. Like right now, he's not doing high intensity training anymore. He's not eating six meals a day. He's not slamming back 400 grams of protein and then boatloads of steroids and all that stuff. He's not doing that. He's looking after his health and fitness. Like his exercise is more geared towards health and fitness and longevity. So uh, he still looks great. Don't get me wrong. He's still, I mean, for a man, I think he's in his fifties. I think I, 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 I'd have to double check to see how, exactly how old he is. But for a man his age, he looks phenomenal, but he's healthy, right? And, and that's so cool because a lot of people, you know, as they, 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 they're not healthy as they get older, but he is. And I, I respect that. So I respect how he took it to the extremes in bodybuilding, maximize that. And now how he's, you know, maximizing the second half of life and actually looking after his health and fitness. So I have a lot of respect for that. Who are some bodybuilders that I know? Um, uh, well, we, one Local bodybuilder that I know, he's from Newfoundland, Frank McGraw. He's a IFBB pro bodybuilder. He, he used to train at the same gym that I trained at, a global gym back in the day. It's it's now since closed and someone else bought it over. It's a different gym. Uh, but that's that's one local bodybuilder I know. Um, who are other bodybuilders? I, I don't really have a lot of close friends who are IFBB pros, uh, but I, I've met a lot of them through years of, you know, you know, through social media and stuff like that and, and chatting with people or going to different events and stuff like that and meeting people who are pro bodybuilders. But like, I don't have a lot of friends that I hang out with who are pros. Um, 
the lady who owns the gym that I train at, she's an IFBB pro bodybuilder or physique competitor. Not, not, um, but yeah, like honestly, at, at this stage of the game, I'm I'm not so much focused on bodybuilding. I'm focusing on health, fitness, and and, and the longevity using bodybuilding techniques. Like it's still a foundation of bodybuilding, the weight training, the nutrition, and all that kind of stuff. But gearing it towards overall health and fitness. That's where I'm to. I'm not much into the competitive side. Like, I really don't know if I'll ever compete again. Maybe, I mean, I'm not going to say never. I mean, maybe I will, but it's it's not a priority. Uh, I'd rather just be lean and healthy year round versus having that, you know, trying to get ripped for a competition, going to the extremes and then having that like all or nothing approach. I like that slow, steady, be in shape year round where I can take my shirt off at the beach any time of year, not have to diet down for six months to get shredded or, or whatever, but just be at the comfortable. Like I don't have to be shredded. I don't have to be, you know, single digit body fat. Like if I can be maintain a 10% body fat year round and be lean and comfortable, that's, that's cool. I'd rather do that than go through the ups and downs of yo-yo dieting that I used to when I was a competitive bodybuilder. Um, we, holy shit, we got an hour and two minutes. I'm going to clue this up very soon, guys. I, 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 I have a tendency to yap a lot. Like the last video chat, if you tuned into that one, we we hit a record. We went over two hours. I'm not going to do that today. But I'm just going to quickly scroll through. We've got TS joining in. He sent a, a super chat, two pound tip. Thank you for that, my friend. He says, "Are you going to make any free weight beginner workouts?" Yeah, I could definitely do that. The first series that I'm going to focus on is going to be machine geared because that's where I would truly recommend beginners focus, machines, because machine workouts are, are easier to master. They're safer. Uh, most people who have access to a public gym these days have access to machine exercises. Like, Take advantage of it. If you have access to a gym, take advantage of the machines that are there. But I can definitely put some free weight workouts together as well. In fact, on my YouTube channel right now, if you go to uh, my playlists, there's a complete home gym dumbbell series that covers dumbbell workouts for all your major muscle groups. That's there. I mean, if you're looking for free weight workouts, that'd be a great place to start. Um, home gym dumbbell workouts, I think it's called. Like, Just open up the playlist link, scroll down there, uh, and you'll see those videos. That was a series that I actually started off in 2019, I, I started that series. So it's a, a year old now, but uh, so, some great free weight exercises, great free weight workouts that you can follow there. Uh, Tyler saying, when was your last Jigs dinner? Um, I never had a true Jigs dinner lately, but I've had like, well, you know, Christmas dinner, whatever was kind of like, the, had the foundation of Jigs dinner plus a turkey. So uh, at Christmas, you know. But as far as a Jigs dinner, just like boiled vegetables and salt beef, you know, the true treat Jigs dinner, I never just limit myself to that. I always got to have some more solid uh, solid uh, protein in there, whether it's a roast beef or, or a turkey or, or something or roast pork. or I, mean, I got to have more meat. And I think technically, if we're getting down to the nitty gritty detail, Jigs dinner is just mostly the boiled vegetables. It's not so much the, the, the roasted meat, but I got to have the roasted meat along with the vegetables. And if anybody doesn't know what the heck I'm talking about, Tyler's obviously a new fee because he's talking about Jig's dinner. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on. Robert's asking his 10 sets of 10 reps of deadlift a bad idea. That's a heck of a lot of deadlifts. Uh, personally, I would not be a big fan of that. I mean, you, you could do it. Hey, but man, it, it's, it's going to be brutal and you're not going to be able to exert a high intensity with those 10 sets because in order to be able to prolong yourself for 10 sets of 10 reps, you have to lift lighter weight. Uh, but again, it really depends on what you're training for and, and your level of fitness and all that. So 10 sets of 10 reps for a beginner, bad idea. Heck yeah. 10 sets of 10 reps for an advanced lifter who's looking to change up their workouts and add some variety. It might be a good idea. So it really depends on you. I, I you know, it's not a one size fits all answer. Jerseys is here and he's sent a two a 199 tip through super chat. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And I'm going to finish off with his question now. I think. Yeah, I'm going to finish off with that one. Because we're getting late. And anyway, he's asking, can I use intermittent fasting to burn fat? I, I already did cover that to a degree. Yes, you can. You can use intermittent fasting to burn body fat. Absolutely. But the drawback to intermittent fasting. 
actually, let, let me let, let's backtrack, right? I mean, hey, you, you, you sent me a tip. I'm going to give you a good answer, and that'll finish off. Hopefully, I'll get an answer within a few minutes, and we can finish off before I hit an hour and thirty. All right. Back when I started my fat loss transformation a few years back, like give you a, a little bit of history, like after my son was born in 2016, you know, a new parent, not getting any sleep. You got a baby in the house. You're waking up in the wee hours of night. You know, the baby's crying. You got a shitty diaper. You got to give him a bottle. You got all, all that stuff. Like, so I wasn't sleeping good because I wasn't sleeping good. I wasn't mentally in a sound state. Like if you were sleep deprived, you are not mentally at your best. So because I was sleep deprived, because I was busier than I've ever been, I just, I kept putting off the workouts. Like I'd say, you know what? I'm busy today. I didn't sleep well the night before. I'll work out tomorrow. Then tomorrow would come along and I'd say, you know what? I didn't sleep well that night either. So I'll work out tomorrow. And the next thing you know, I'd say like, oh, screw it. I'll start again on Monday. And so that kind of attitude doesn't take long to figure out what where it's going to lead, right? You know, so my fitness gradually got worse and worse and worse. When it came to the eating, I was like, man, I'm so busy. I'm hungry. Like, I don't want to boil chicken and broccoli and blah, blah, blah. Domino's, deliver me a jumbo pizza with the works, right? Like, that was the way my diet went for, for a few years, right? Like, it went that way. You know, instead of eating clean and working out consistently, like, I, I would be on and off with the workouts, you know, instead of exercising every day. I probably exercise two or three days a week tops. And instead of eating clean every day, I'd be, you know, sneaking in junk food and takeout and fast food and pizza and Chinese and all that stuff. And Hey, I got fat. I got out of shape. I, I lost muscle. I gained fat and I totally did the opposite of what I want to do. So uh, if, if you want to see my trend, you want to read the story, Go to muscleafter40blueprint.com. That's my personal website where I share my after 40 transformation story. You know, how I went down, you know, went went bad and turned it around. Anyway, in the early phase of that transformation, I followed intermittent fasting. And the reason I followed intermittent fasting is because it's the easiest diet to follow. Like, there is no meal prep or very little meal prep because all day long you're not eating, right? You're, you're drinking coffee, you're drinking water, you're just consuming zero calorie beverages. So I mean, from it, from a, a follow stick to the diet type of thing, intermittent fasting is easy. That's, that's a plus, right? If you're looking for, you know, pros and cons, the pro of intermittent fasting is it's easy. There's no, you don't need to be Tupperware in your food and prepping meal all day long or anything like that. You just get up, have your water, have your coffee and get to work. Do your, do your shit that you got to do that day. So I do that. I just do my work, do my chores, do my errands, all that. And then at the end of the day, I would, you know, have dinner with the family. That's when my feeding window started was at dinner time. And then I usually have dinners and then a couple snacks later in the evening. And that worked. I, I lost weight following that type of protocol because that just the fact that I was eating fewer meals put me in a calorie deficit. And it worked for several months. I, I got steady progress for several months without even counting calories, without tracking macros, without even being perfect with my diet. Just by intermittent fasting, I got at least three solid months of good fat loss. And, you know, I, I was doing half-ass workouts at the time. I mean, it wasn't as consistent as I am now. But, it, it, you know, as you get into the habit of, of eating better, seeing some weight drop on the scale, it kind of motivates you to work out consistently as well. So through it all, I made some progress. But again, you got to realize, like I was at the deconditioned beginner's phase coming back to the gym after a layoff. So anything you do consistently at that stage is going to work because when your body's deconditioned and out of, out of shape, like any consistent workout, any consistent eating is, is better than the no consistency. So it actually worked for me. I, I got great results with intermittent fasting. And I did that. I followed it for about a year and for the first half of the year, I was making progress for the second half of the year. I was just kind of like maintaining very little progress with intermittent fasting because what was happening is now I was no longer in a calorie deficit because my appetite was starting to increase and I was getting used to the whole idea of going all day with no food. And then just when my feeding window started, I would just start eating and it became harder to control my appetite because my blood sugar was so low at the end of the day when I would start eating that I, I would eat too fast. I would eat too much. 
and ultimately I was putting myself back up into either calorie maintenance or even calorie surplus, even though I was intermittent fasting. And like I mentioned before, it's not calorie, it, it's not whether you eat six meals a day or you eat one meal a day or whatever. It's how much food you eat in the day, whether regardless of how you split it up. It's, it's what you eat. It's most important, not how you eat it. So because I wasn't no longer in a calorie deficit, then I wasn't getting progress with the intermittent fasting. And what I did at that stage is I decided, you know, I'm going to go back to more of a traditional bodybuilding program where I eat more frequently throughout the day and see how that works. So then I started having, you know, uh, some protein and carbs and, and veggies with, with breakfast. And then I'd have like protein, carbs and veggies with lunch and protein, carbs and veggies with dinner and protein, carbs and veggies before I go to bed. And so I basically eat four times a day. I, you know, my three squares plus a snack before bed. That, that's, that was the way I was eating. And I found that was so much better because now my energy and my appetite was stable. I wasn't going through the spikes, you know, where nothing, nothing, nothing for hours on end. And then this big, massive meal, right, where I just, you know, end up eating too much in one go because I was starving. So I actually found the, the frequent smaller meals worked better. And I had more consistent energy throughout the day. And I wasn't going through, you know, feeling hunger and, and I actually had better workouts as well. So I was more because I had more steady energy and I felt better in, my, in the gym. I was training harder, training more consistently. And ultimately that helped as well. So this that's where I'm at now, like th three squares plus a snack before bed, right? Breakfast, lunch, dinner and snack. So I have four meals a day. That's what I eat right now. And I find that that works well. And it also works well with the average world, like because most people have three meals a day, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. You know, you, for people who say, well, I can't stick to a bodybuilding diet because I'm at work. Like all, every workplace that I know allows you to have a lunch break so you can make it fit within your, your schedule. <laughs> right. So three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, that fits 80 to 90 percent of the population have breakfast lunch and dinner so it works well from a practical stick to point of view and then a snack before bed that's that's very easy to do as well so it's it's not like this crazy oh six meals a day how do i fit in six meals a day it, you know it's not one of those type of scenarios it's a very realistic and doable plan and that's what i personally do now and i find it works better and i prefer that over intermittent fasting however I will sometimes occasionally use intermittent fasting as a strategy if I, in, in rare exceptions. And I'll give you an example. If I know we're going out to a restaurant that like in the evening, I'll probably use intermittent fasting because I say, okay, I'm going to go to a restaurant. I know I'm going to eat too much food. I'm going to eat the whatever, you know, the, the, the high fat sauces, and gravies, whatever's in the restaurant food. So I know it's going to be a high calorie meal. I want to kind of keep my daily total in check. So I might follow intermittent fasting that day and then enjoy my restaurant meal that night and uh, keep my calories in check for that day. So I don't, you know, end up in a calorie surplus and get fat because I went out to a restaurant. When I travel, I very often follow intermittent fasting because again, you're eating out in restaurants a lot of times and not in control of my meals. So uh, I do that. In fact, I made a video a while back talking about that, how I stayed lean while traveling. And that was my strategy, intermittent fasting. So I'd fast throughout the day and then I'd go out and, and enjoy dinner at the restaurants that night. You know, eat, eat pretty much whatever I wanted at the restaurant within reason. You know, I, I wouldn't go overboard, but I would eat till I was comfortably full and satisfied and didn't deprive myself. And then I'd still keep my weight in check. So it, it has its benefits, right? Don't get me wrong. Intermittent fasting has its benefits. But I personally am more of a fan of more frequent, uh, smaller meals rather than the bigger infrequent meal. So hopefully that helps Mr. Jersey's chosen one answer your question. And with that being said, I'm going to clue it up for today. So there we go, guys. <laughs> da -da -da -da, the, big, the big grand finale of the video chat, right? Da -da 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 -da. So hopefully you enjoyed this one. Uh, I enjoy doing these video chats as always, and I will have the replay of this video chat posted up over the weekend with all the timestamps. So if you want to go back and, and review the chat without going through an hour and a half of video, you want to jump to the specific questions that are more appropriate to you and your situation, you can do that. And that applies to all my past video chats. Pretty much all the past video chats have the 
replays with the time codes and timestamps there. So if you want to jump to certain questions, you can do so. And uh, another thing I want to remind you, if you are interested in losing your gut and getting back in shape now in 2020, on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page, we have the Lose Your Gut Challenge going on. It's going to start next Friday is when we kick it off. So if you're interested in that, you can, one, you can email me, leeh at leehayward.com and just ask me what's up with the Lose Your Gut Challenge and I'll send you the details through email. Or if you want, you can go over to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page. Just search for Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding on Facebook and you'll see it. Or you can also join, we have a private Facebook group as well. So you can like the page, you can join the group. Uh, and in there, I will send you the details of the Lose Your Gut Challenge as well. But bottom line, the whole Lose Your Gut Challenge is basically an intensive five-day coaching program where I'm going to be going deep with you. I'm going to provide you with everything you need to maximize your nutrition, your mindset, coaching. There's going to be like live videos every single day. There's going to be a nutrition cheat sheet. There's going to be meal plan guides, uh, meal prep guides. Like every single day, it's it's an interactive challenge to get you to take action so that you can improve your nutrition, your mindset, and basically get you on the right track in 2020 to losing the gut, building muscle, and getting back in shape. And this is an interactive challenge. It's an What I mean by that is if you don't participate in the challenge, you get kicked out of the challenge. That's what makes it cool because most people like to, to watch and like tune into stuff like this and say, well, I'm not actually going to do anything, but I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and lurk and see what's on the go and, and watch passively. Well, guess what? All those passive lurkers who don't actually do anything, they get kicked out. I just want action takers. That's the way that these challenges work. So we may start off with like, like last challenge we did, I think there was 160 people joined the challenge. By the time that the challenge ended, we were down to less than not somewhere around 70 people. Like over half the people got kicked out of the challenge because they didn't do their, they didn't follow along and keep up. Uh, so that's the way it works, right? You have to actively participate in order to stay in the challenge. If you're just sitting there and lurking and hoping to, you know, watch without anybody noticing, I, I kick you out because that's the way the whole Facebook group is. I can lo log in there from the administrative side and I can say, okay, this person didn't do anything, right? Like you didn't do your homework assignment that I asked you. Like every day there's a homework assignment. It's not a, a difficult one, but it is a homework assignment that's going to put you outside your comfort zone and make you take action towards improving your health and fitness and nutrition and all that. And if you don't do it, then guess what? I go through the whole challenge. I say, okay, we've who, who did their homework the night before? And I go through, da, 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 okay, this guy did, this guy did, this guy did. Okay, he didn't. Get out. And I go through the challenge. And every day I purge the group. So by the end of the challenge, we've got a small group of guys who are highly motivated action takers who are actually getting shit done and seeing progress. And I'm telling you, like over the course of the challenge, I've seen guys like like drop weight and, and see noticeable changes, like even in the, the short challenge itself. And then, of course, they take those habits and then they continue implementing them. Um, like I, I ran a challenge back in November. One of the guys, uh, Derek, for example, he's, he's just one that came to the top of my mind. I was chatting with him today, actually. And um, he, he's lost 20 pounds of body fat since November. Like, that's huge progress. 20 pounds of body fat while building muscle on his frame at the same time. Over the holidays. Like, he went through the, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas holidays, all this time when people are supposed to be getting fat and out of shape. He ended up losing 20 pounds. Right. Since November. I mean, that's awesome progress. I mean, he still wants to lose more and he's still on the right track. But it just goes to show, like, once you get your shit together and you have a system that actually works and you follow it, boom, things just happen. You start losing weight. You start getting in shape. You start seeing the, the body transformation that you want. And once you start to see it happen and, you know, you're looking in the mirror and you see the changes, you your before and after pictures, you start seeing progress. You take your your tape measurements around the waist and you're like, holy crap, like, I got to tighten up my belt another notch or now my pants are too big. I need to buy smaller pants. Like that is motivating. Once that stuff starts happening, then your motivation is going to go through the roof and you're just going to want to do more and more and even accelerate the process even more. So that's the purpose of the lose your gut challenge. It's like a, a kick started. So like a virtual kick in the arse to get you off your butt and doing something to move yourself in the right direction to do what you know you should do. 
so that you start get, taking care of your health and fitness versus putting it off all the time, saying, oh, I'll start next week, oh, I'll start next month, oh, I'll start next year. Like, no, do it now. Like, <laughs> life is passing you by, right? Do it now. <laughs> That's the whole purpose of it. So it's, it's an interactive challenge, and I hope you participate in it. So again, it'll be kicking off next Friday on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page. Go in there, send me an email, send me a message if you want some details, and I will add you to our challenge group and we get this show on the road. All right. So with that being said, I'm going to clue it up. Have yourself a great weekend. I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Over and out.